you want to learn more about nuclear medicine, click here. Hi, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Curry. I'm an Associate Professor in Medical Radiation Science at Charles Sturt University and at Regis University in Boston, but most people call me Jeff. I've specialised in nuclear medicine for more than three decades, working clinically, in research and in teaching, both in Australia and overseas. In this video, I'll explain what nuclear medicine is, how it's produced and how it can improve the health outcomes of patients and, importantly, help to save people's lives. Medicine might not be the first thing you think of when someone uses the word nuclear. But in Australia, nuclear is all about research, diagnosis and therapies that could save lives and improve the outcomes of others. Although the average Australian will need nuclear medicine procedure twice in their life, not many people know about nuclear medicine or the nuclear medicine production cycle, which is what I'm here to tell you about today. This is ANSA's multi-purpose reactor in Sydney's Lucas Heights. It's one of the newest, safest and most advanced nuclear reactors in the world today. Most other reactors in the world use highly enriched uranium, which increases costs and of course waste, and decreases security because the fuel could be diverted into weaponry. Not so in Australia. Our Opal reactor's core is just the size of a bar fridge, and it contains only 25 kilograms of low enriched uranium. It runs at low pressure and a temperature of just 45 degrees. Inside the reactor pool itself, a process called fission occurs. This enables the production of an important nuclear medicine called molybdenum-99. More than 80% of nuclear medicine studies are done with a radionuclide called technetium-99M, which comes from the parent isotope molybdenum-99. This medicine has to be radioactive to work and provide an accurate diagnosis to patients. Molybdenum-99 has a 67 hour half-life. That means every 67 hours there is half the amount of useful radioactivity that was there to start with. So it's a race against time to get the medicine to more than 250 hospitals and nuclear medicine centres across Australia and around the region. In hospitals, molybdenum-99 decays to technetium-99M, and that's what is administered to patients. In addition to all the important molybdenum-99-based products, the reactor also produces other nuclear medicines, like iodine 131 which is used for thyroid cancer therapy, and many others. One of the most common procedures performed in nuclear medicine is the bone scan and it involves the injection of a radio trace that piggybacks on a product called phosphate that's found normally in bones. We use sensitive machines called gamma cameras that pick up minute amounts of radioactivity that exist inside the human body, and that's our nuclear medicines, to provide extraordinary amounts of physiological information, enabling doctors to see what's going on inside the body. We use this tool alongside others like traditional x-rays to provide different views and insights into what's happening inside the human body. And by putting them together, doctors get the best idea of what's going on leading to better diagnosis and treatments. With more than 664,000 nuclear medicine procedures done in Australia each year, a population of 24 million people, and an average life expectancy beyond 80 years, the average Aussie will have a nuclear medicine procedure every 36 years. That's more than two in the average lifespan. It's not as common as paracetamol, but you get my drift. While 80% of nuclear medicine procedures are reactor produced, some are produced in a different kind of device called a cyclotron. They make things such as fluorine 18 for PET studies which are used for diagnosis of cancers, heart problems and other things. And gallium 67 which is used for infections and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Cyclotrons are a valuable part of the radionuclide production landscape and they have a specific purpose like anything else. You wouldn't use a VW Beetle the same way you'd use a bus, right? It's also possible to reduce technetium 99M directly in one of these large cyclotrons if it's set up the right way. In Canada, they are trying to find a way to use cyclotrons to produce large scales of technetium 99M. This is because their nuclear reactor project had major flaws. In theory, this approach would produce less waste. While this might be an option worth considering one day, at the moment there are a few problems with it. The Canadian experiment is currently producing enough medicine for probably two or three nuclear medicine departments in hospitals typical of Sydney or Melbourne. So it does not get anywhere near the scale of medicine needed in one city of relatively small market in Australia. The Cyclotron product has many impurities when it's made, and it takes time and money to make sure each batch is suitable for injection in humans. As far as I know, there's no commercial production of Technetium 99M in Cyclotrons that meets regulatory standards for injection into humans in Australia. And probably the biggest problem of all, unlike the parent isotope from nuclear reactor with a 67 hour half-life, the Cyclotron product only has a six hour half-life, leaving little time for testing, shipping and administration for patients. 
Because it has such a short half-life, for the Cyclotron model to work, you would need a network of expensive instruments near population centres across the country, and the experts to staff them, costing many times more than a single nuclear reactor. In addition to expense, this also brings a number of logistic challenges. With Cyclotron produced medicine, you need daily shipping, meaning that it is sensitive to any time delays, and there is no provision for 24-hour emergency supplies or weekend deliveries. This would make things complicated in metropolitan areas, and even more so in rural and regional areas. And of course, the further the medical service is from the production site, the less product they get, and the more times you need to ship it, meaning you end up with more radioactive material on the roads, more often. And finally, cyclotrons rely on highly enriched molybdenum 100 targets, which are expensive and currently only produced in Russia. I really like the idea of technetium 99M production in a cyclotron. And I think it'll be part of the landscape one day, but it won't replace the reactor. And at the moment, it's not even close to a suitable supplement. The future of nuclear medicine in Australia is secure because of our nuclear reactor and the proven production capacity it has. Australia's Opal Reactor will continue to make sure we have access to crucial, life-changing and life-saving diagnostic and therapeutic procedures and that they are provided to our regional partners. But will also ensure the costs of these medicines remains within the reach of all and will also assist in medical research. While the multi-purpose nuclear reactor is the best option that Australia has moving forward, we also need to make way for dealing with its waste. Radioactive waste is currently spread over more than 100 locations in this country. Like other industrial byproducts, radioactive waste is safe if it's managed properly. You can even stand right next to the containers that hold it at Ansto. The federal government is searching for a place to dispose of Australia's low-level waste, like these drums here at Ansto, and to safely store our intermediate level waste until a permanent disposal solution can be found. In conclusion, what I can tell you is we can't stop producing nuclear medicines because they are a far too important part of the healthcare system and services to you, involving diagnosis and treating of many diseases and conditions, offering help to many Australians. And at least for the foreseeable future, we don't have any alternatives. Thank you for tuning into this explainer, and I hope you now understand how the nuclear medicine production cycle works.